Welcome to Say Hello to the Bad Guy. I'm your host, Locke, and this is the podcast where we drink, smoke, and bullshit about the life of a historic criminal. Now we're talking outlaws and gangsters. We're not going to be covering too many serial killers. That's just a little bit dark for me, and this ain't no true crime podcast. But really, you can't even call this a history podcast because I'm no historian. I'm just a history fan that does some research and bullshits about it with his friends. So, speaking of my friends, let me introduce you to my co-host today. First, I got with me the original bad guy co-host, the Duke. <laughs> what up? The original bad guy, son. <laughs> now, when it comes to drinking beer, I've always kind of we've compared you to a goat. You kind of just drink whatever without complaining. But oh, I thought you meant I was the greatest of all time. It looks like you stepped your game up a little bit today. Yeah, I got uh, some sticky, icky, icky. I, I don't know. I never tried it, but it's got a hairy man, Scrooge McDuckin, into a pile <laughs> of uh, weed. So I was like, <laughs> that could be me. Well, uh, we talked about it one time. Anything, if you throw bastard on the name, yeah, I'm yeah, just yeah. a giant child, so I like it. So yeah, if you call a beer <laughs> sticky, icky, icky, it's going to get picked up. Well, I'm such a child. I judge my beer and like my sports teams by their logos and shit. Like, that, that looks cool. <laughs> I like it. That's how I go. All right, uh, back with us today, we got Cancer. What up? Welcome back to the podcast. Ah, thanks for having me. All right, and I know uh, last time you was talking about, like, uh, the founder's Scotch Ale. Yeah, but uh, I think my beer is the most childish of all of yours today because I have Bean Flicker. <laughs> oh, uh, Coffee Blonde Ale from Oddside, which is really, really fucking good. Uh, it's actually one of my favorites because I like coffee beers, but typically mm-hmm. that's with your stouts and your porters. You don't, yeah. you don't get a lot of light beers. Well, that's what's with, cool about blonde ale is you can mix pretty much anything into a blonde ale. Like, they'll have a blonde chocolate or this and that. So anything with coffee, like a blonde ale with coffee, I'm, I'm there, no matter who makes it. See, I'm a little ashamed to admit, I'm like an Eskimo with snow when it comes to words for a male masturbating, but it took me forever before I learned what bean flicking meant. Ah. <laughs> like, I was yeah. a grown man. I think it was Jenny who was drinking one of them beers, and she was making jokes. I was like... <laughs> What's the bean flicking? I'm like, oh, I'm way too ill-informed about this. <laughs> well, welcome like to the a, joke. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> welcome to more childish humor. <laughs> like, if there's a beer called Fog and the Dolphin, I know what that's all about. Beating the bishop. <laughs> so uh, I went with uh, Atwater Detroit Pale Ale because I just found out today that uh, Molson Coors bought Atwater. Ah, uh, yeah. So I'm not going to be able to be a beer snob and call it a local beer for right, too much yeah, longer. Yeah. So yep. I figured might as well while I still got the chance. Yeah, it sucks <laughs> to be you. This is all local, baby. Yeah. For now. Give <laughs> him yeah. another year. Well, I mean, when that money comes, what are you going to do? Yeah. They're gobbling them up, man. Now, we talked about it a little bit last time, but I know you, you've you been rapping a long time. And then now your last album, it was called Grenades, Pistols, and Rape Whistles, right? <laughs> yeah. Yep. All right. That's available on, like, Bandcamp? Or- yeah, Spotify, iTunes, um, your next door neighbor's veterinarian probably has it. <laughs> Uh, probably cheaper than what you would get it online. But yeah, I mean, you could pretty much find it anywhere. All right. And and, and if you type in grenades, pistols, and rape whistles, besides being on a list somewhere for the government, it, my album should be one of the first things to pop up. I, I tried it to make sure. And as I was doing <laughs> it, I thought, well, this is this is skeptical. We'll give it a shot. But yeah, it was the first thing that popped up. And the so. feds didn't come, right? Not yet. <laughs> oh, <they're good. laughs> it's still early. Yeah, I mean, you know, give it time, but. Oh. What's uh? What's your style rapping? By the way, um, like, I don't know. I mean, traditionally, I guess they would call it boom bap, but it's um, just like funny, violent shit. <laughs> Word, you know what I'm saying? Like that's pretty much how I always sum it up. But what kind of uh? Is it almost like '90s style? You're an older cat. Yeah, I guess you would say like '90s shit. Yeah, yeah. yeah. that's what I. That's the rap. I, I mean, I don't, mu- I don't mumble, and I don't have face tattoos <laughs> or skittle colored fucking teeth but yeah, you ain't I mean, little cancer no, no not little cancer i've always been <laughs> short cancer but never little cancer <laughs> maybe that's your problem is you're making good music you should have started mumbling a long time I, ago yeah, trust you me, shot to the top of the charts every time i look at the list i'm like yeah i could have done that but no nah, i'm happy where i'm at fuck that <laughs> keep the integrity yeah i like to keep it real Word. Now, uh, before we get started, I got to make sure I thank Six Fo Sueno for letting us use his song for the intro music. He's a local Detroit rapper, talented kid. So subscribe to his YouTube channel, follow him on social media, support local artists. You can also now follow us on Instagram at Bad Guy Podcast on Instagram. Nice. Oh, moving up. All right, we'll go ahead and get started. And the bad guy we're going to cover today is Thomas Patera. This ain't negotiation time. This is Scarface, final scene, fucking bazookas under each arm. Say hello to my little friend. Thomas Patera, 
I feel like he should be on the all nickname team, not on quantity, but on quality. <laughs> all right. His, uh, I his can't nick- wait. He was also known as Tommy Karate. <laughs> I, I mean, there you go. <laughs> did, did Danny McBride play him in the movie? <laughs> that that does sound like a Danny McBride character. Tommy Karate. All right. So it, it seriously, that sounds like uh, the old Living Color sketch. Karate protecting my body. Yeah, yeah. That's so great. yeah, Thomas Patera, aka Tommy Karate. Honestly. I picked him because when I started, you know, I've always got to do research on these guys. When I started looking around, I was like, as soon as I seen the nickname, I'm like, bam, we're covering him. Oh, yeah, that's, that's yeah. great. You, you can't scroll past that. <laughs> I got, got to dig deeper. No shit. So, uh, Tommy was born December 2nd, 1954. He's the second of two children, and he was raised in the Gravesend neighborhood of Brooklyn. Big surprise, it was called Gravesend because it was built around the Gravesend Cemetery. And that was kind of the centerpiece of the neighborhood. I'm so jealous of all these fucking people that grow up in these neighborhoods that have, like, really cool... I grew up in Hell's Kitchen. You know what I'm saying? I grew up in uh, Gravesend. Fucking Dolphin Murder. And, you know what I'm saying? Like, all these cool fucking names. Like, I, I grew up in Southgate. <laughs> <laughs> we, we did a... We called our neighborhood Southgate. <laughs> the, the gate. You can go with the, the gate. gate. Ooh. <laughs> From Wyandotte, the Dirty Dot, son. <laughs> yeah, sweet. For people that don't know, that is the whitest town ever. <laughs> uh, we, we covered a guy one time, Lee Murray. He was from Shooter's Alley. Yeah, see, that's what I'm talking about. Yeah. <laughs> that's much better. Much better. Look, I mean, you know you're destined to become a bad guy when you're born in Gravesend. Yeah, like 100%. What, what else are you going to do? Now, Gravesend, even though New York is obviously a big city, Gravesend was kind of like a real tight-knit community. So everybody knew each other. There's no outsiders. It was a predominantly Italian community. So obviously the maf- mafia kind of flourished in that neighborhood. Okay. So the, mob- the mafia was the local heroes, and they all hook out, uh, hung out at the local mob bars and social clubs and stuff like that. If, if you grew up in Gravesend, you grew up... Well, and it was around the same time. We, we've all seen uh, Bronx Tale. Yeah. It's kind of like that. That's okay. what you do. You grow up in the neighborhood just watching the mobsters do It's like a thing. way of life. It's just there. Well, I mean, it sounds like even today in the hood, just you got your block and the people, the tight-knit community, and then that's your territory. Because yep. that's like just the mob was Italian-based, and they had their section. Yep. When Tommy was growing up, he was viciously bullied daily. He was real small. He was real frail. And he had a squeaky falsetto voice. That nice. Some people said he sounded like Michael Jackson or Mickey Mouse. I can't relate at all. <laughs> ah, come at on, all. guys. One day I'm a little karate. I'm going to come back. I'm going to whoop all your asses. Uh, some of the beatings were so bad. Uh, one of the quotes I was listening to, the guy compared his bullying to chaining a dog to a fence and beating it every day. Jeez. Damn. So basically, there's nowhere you can go, and it's going to keep coming. So. That's all you got. Yeah, man, that's horrible. The two things they said about him getting bullied growing up is it said he always lost and he never gave up. So he was real scrappy, <laughs> but he was just always getting the shit what beat out of him. What a reputation to have. <laughs> He's got a lot of heart. Can't fight for shit, but <laughs> man. He was like Nick Totoro from The Longest Yard, the little <laughs> Mexican guy that kept yeah. on just getting beat up but kept on going at him. A little scrappy dude. Good yep. Lord, man. Hey, whatever. Proud. You're tiny dude getting your ass kicked. Keep on going. But it builds character. <laughs> yeah. And. Tough uh, skin, I guess, <laughs> on your face. But, like the, 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 the movie Knock Around Guys, where it says 500. You oh, got to get yeah, a 500 yeah. fist fights before you can sit, consider yourself a real tough guy. So so he's officially a tough guy? <laughs> no. No, he was, a, he was a little kid that was getting the shit oh, beat on him. But in 1966, the Green Hornet came out. And Bruce Lee played Cato <laughs> in the Green Hornet. Yeah. And he became obsessed with Bruce Lee and the martial arts. Oh, man. Ah, I wonder you guys keep picking on me. I'm a gr- I'm no karate. I'm going to get you. I'm going to put on a black mask. Well, he, he asked his dad to put him in karate, and his, his dad let him. So his dad signed him up in karate. Yeah, but it'll stop you from getting your ass whooped every fucking day. <laughs> Viciously like a dog. Viciously. Well, see, this is uh, you know, it's so back in the day and how much times have changed. Because nowadays, I hear that, I'm like, man, he should go into, like, Muay Thai or something. Why karate? That's a yeah, lame yeah. ass one. Like, yeah, that back, was, like, the only option, I think, back then. Yeah, back <laughs> in the day, karate just was martial, martial arts wasn't a thing. It was just, oh, yeah, karate or kung fu. Well, but there were probably the a bunch of them all over the place, too. Like, you know, I don't know if strip malls were a thing at that time because I don't know the origin of strip malls, <laughs> but if there were, 
Every strip mall has a karate place in it. For so. sure. Well, even still today, even now when jujitsu is a thing, karate studios are still PKSA yeah. is all over the place. Yeah, so, sure. oh yeah. Well, and you could see that karate was because this is the '60s and karate was huge then. Yeah. But just off the fact, Bruce Lee wasn't a karate guy. He was a kung fu guy. Right, And he right. still said, yeah, I like Bruce Lee. I'm going to join karate. Yeah, they don't know the difference. You know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> I love Japanese food. I'm going to have some uh, egg roll. <laughs> it's not even Japanese food. See, what's fucked up is what if he goes to class, all the people that are whooping his ass are going to that class. Ah, they know all my tricks. <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> got to be the worst thing to show up to class and it's all the people that whoop yeah, your ass on a like, daily basis. God damn They're it. just going to get better. <laughs> and you're just going to be. And then the sensei is like, all right, uh, you. You two match up, yeah. son of a bitch. I mean, that's kind of like Cobra Kai, right? <laughs> what happened? He tried to go learn his shit. And yep. Turns out Johnny's the prize studio. Like, oh, fuck. if Tommy yep. finds a little Chinese gardener and that's how he learns how to do tricks, this story got 100% <laughs> better. <laughs> he basically just threw himself into karate. So they say once he started karate, that's all he did was he was either at karate class, he was working out, or he's in front of a mirror practicing his karate. And that's <laughs> all he did. <laughs> just this little tiny Italian <laughs> kid, high pitch, that. just in the, you talking to me? Yeah, yeah, chat to yourself, <laughs> yeah, you talking would, to me? I would love to see that. Like, no <laughs> wonder he's getting picked on. He's shadow boxing in the mirror. <laughs> By the time he was in high school, no, he, he wasn't big because he never got to be too big of a guy. But he was he was strong and he was muscular and he was really confident and he could fight. And he didn't take shit no more, and nobody fucked with him. So nice. Once he got to high school, I Mission mean, accomplished. It, it worked. You can't do you can't do that today. You go take some karate lessons. You go to school. They're still gonna kick the shit out of you. <laughs> yeah, tiny guys. Those are the ones you gotta look out for because those mm-hmm. are the crazy ones. Those are the ones resourceful, that, crazy, yeah, all that shit. Well, just you know, if they're scrappy, that means they're used to getting their ass kicked. Mm-hmm. Like, what are you gonna do to this guy? Like. Well, and they're crazy, so you don't know what they're going to do. <laughs> they have mirrors. They know they're little, yeah. and they're still down to go. Yeah, like, so they got to be ready to fight. Like a dude that's twice your size, chances are he's not going to whip out a knife and stab you. Right, that right. little dude, yep. he'll probably stab you right in the ball sack. <laughs> so after he graduates high school uh, in 1974, he's 19 years old, and he entered this like giant New York karate competition where he ended up having to beat seven different dudes in order to win. He wins the tournament, and first place was a room and board scholarship to go study karate under, like, the best masters in Japan. Oh, shit. Damn, Dana-san didn't even get that shit. <laughs> right? That's so amazing. So he took it up, and he went to Japan, spent his year on the scholarship, and then when his scholarship was up, he stayed for another year on his own, which he funded with a job that he got at a local chopstick factory. No shit. Wow. That's excellent. Are we going to learn about the first white samurai? Is that what the story is? <laughs> yeah, he, it's, it's actually Steven Seagal. <laughs> That's <laughs> what we're talking about. I think, like, it's so crazy that you're in Japan, you need to get a job, you go to a chopstick factory. Like, <laughs> if, if, we were, if we were to write that, that'd be like, no, that's too cliche, yeah, yeah, nobody's going to buy yeah. that. Well, he's a little tiny uh, Italian dude from the bra. he probably got there like, ah, I need a job. Uh, hey, is there a chopstick factory around there? It's the only thing I know. Yeah, they <laughs> probably didn't, yeah, they didn't get the sarcasm, they're like, oh yeah, right over there, go work. Uh, he might not even be sarcastic, but his Italian neighborhood, his experience to Japanese culture would have been fairly limited up yeah. until that that point so yeah um, well that's what i'm saying like they probably weren't even insulted they probably really thought like oh yeah this guy's looking for a job <laughs> yeah. yes we're actually actually hiring come yeah, on that's in where we are the last six uh little five-year-olds we had working there have died off so we need you little guy oh man maybe they thought he was like seven like you're tiny enough they were disappointed to find out he was like 20 at the time <laughs> oh you're an adult man we're looking for child <laughs> yeah. labor god damn it <laughs> no we yeah, almost got to pay you a living wage <laughs> yeah, yeah we have one penny more ah oh, fuck we gotta start giving you two puddings by 1976 he had spent two years in japan and he decided it was time to go back home so 1976 he returned Back to Gravesend, Brooklyn. So when he came back in 1976, he had just been living the martial arts lifestyle for a couple of years. Now, he only ever topped out at 5'6". Okay. <clears throat> and I had to do that math off a of mugshot. So, <laughs> so that's not an official number. Still that's, taller than me. So we're going to go with 5'6". But by the time he come back, he was a legit badass. He was ripped. He was real big. Nice. And, uh, and he decided growing up in that area, he had all, like, the, the guys they looked up to were always mobsters. So he decided he's going to start hanging out at these mob bars and these mob spots and start ah. looking for connections, which eventually he found. He met up with a guy whose name was Anthony Bruno Indelicato. Of 
course. Who went by the nickname <laughs> Whack Whack. What? Because Bruno's not a badass enough name. <clears throat> this Gotta is, go with Whack Whack. Yeah, yeah, this is the thing we've gone through a thousand. Like, why do people with cool ass names choose to go by a nickname? Yeah, exactly. Like, just have your cool ass name. That fucking name is awesome. <laughs> like, yeah, I like Whack Whack. But, well, of course, it's one of those things where back then, like, somebody actually gave you the nickname. Not like the era we grew up in where everybody gave themselves a nickname. Exactly. He probably didn't say, ooh, this would be cool. Call yeah, me Whack Whack. Yeah, call me Whack Whack. I mean, I was called Whack Whack when I was like 12. Probably but for a very different, yeah, <laughs> different reason. Completely different reason. I was at camp and it was, yeah. Yeah, it was a rough period. I was bean flicking. <laughs> well, and that's what's fucked up. Like, when you go by Whack Whack, you better be a badass. Oh, because yeah. you don't want people to question why you have that nickname. Yeah, yeah. So I'm going to go with Bruno because I don't want to keep saying Whack Whack. Yeah, well, what was his last name again? Indelicato. Man, it's such a cool last name. I don't know. I got to say, if my name was Bruno, I would have to change. Like, give me a different nickname than Bruno. But what I don't a, think Whack Whack would be good. What a melodic name, though. Bruno and Indelicato. You yeah. know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. Well, you can have anything in front of Delicato. Delicato. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> be like Doug Delicato. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hey, this is True. Gilbert Delicato. Like, yeah. <laughs> You're right. W- what's crazy? Skyler Delicato. <laughs> like, any fucking name. <laughs> His dad had the same name, and he, so Whack he was Whack Whack Junior. But he went by Sunny Red. So you got oh both these guys. God. One's one's Whack Whack, and one's Sunny Red. It's not bad enough that you you live in Graves End, which is cool as shit. But now you have all these other <laughs> nicknames. Like God damn, man. I we mean, just it's, Ital- nicknames it's Italian meatheads. They don't know. Like, hey, did you see how he hit that kid? Hey, it's Whack Whack. <laughs> it's called Whack Whack. Well, Bam Bam was taken. Yeah, that's probably so what they yeah. do. They're probably watching Flintstones. Like, hey, it's like Bam Bam, but he's Whack Whack. <laughs> I think we're talking about Tommy Karate because he knew karate. Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. They're, they're not real thinkers. They don't dig. They don't do deep dives on these nicknames. And we're going back to like their sweet ass names, half those sweet ass names were their father's names. So like their ancestors had cool names, and then they're just like, ah, we're no good with names. We're just gonna keep on going. It's like, why is his nickname fell down the stairs last weekend? <laughs> You know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> yeah. kind of tells its own story. We just did a podcast about Super Killer. And we mm-hmm. go from Super Killer to Tommy Karate and Whack Whack. Yeah. <laughs> Tommy Kar- Oh, that's not like an adult swim cartoon. Yeah, that's a great... That's <laughs> Tommy great. Karate and Whack Whack. That's, a, that's amazing. The, the buddy comedy we've been waiting for yeah, this whole is. time. Oh, I'm down for that. that. We can't publish this till we start that comic. Now, this is out of the timeline, but long time... Like, <laughs> like long way down the road... Bruno Indelicato, his claim to fame would technically be he was the guy that Joe Pistone was supposed to hit in order to get made before they pulled the plug on the Donnie Brasco operation. Ah, okay. They wanted Donnie Brasco to kill Whack Whack. Ah, And that's why they they stopped that operation. Couldn't Whack Whack Whack? (laughs) (laughs) But anyway, so he come from a mob family. He was a mobster. His dad was a mob capo. And they were in the banana crime family. So the big difference between the banana crime family and a lot of the other five families is that they were one sil- one vowel away from a ridiculous name. Yes, <laughs> but they made up for it. Look, the same way these stories, no matter which way you're telling it, it all plays out the same. They're also known as one of the five. They're the most violent of the five families. Got it. So just like the story keeps going along, when you yeah. got a goofy name, a boy named Sue, it, it's a thing. <laughs> yeah, I That's mean, where it goes. Fight or flight. Uh, the other thing that separated them from the other families was this was at a time when the other families were still either not letting their guys sell drugs or, oh, okay. or at least pretending to not let their guys. So, you know, some bosses were like, don't do it, but they just kind of turned their head, but yeah. it's cool. They didn't want the other bosses to know what that they were doing. It. Right. And some of them were officially like, fuck no, no drugs. Right. The Banano family was the first family that was like, I don't give a fuck. So <laughs> drug. If Does you're it, kicking can it we up, make money? Can we make money? Is right. it illegal? Yeah, fuck yeah, yeah, let's do it. But it's great. Like, soon as one family starts doing it, the rest are like, well, fuck it, I guess we'll do it too. Well, yeah, like, I mean, like, you can't let one family have more or do more than you are, you know what I'm saying? Especially in the same neighborhoods and the same areas. But, but see, that also it goes back to that whole... Uh, Mob is so uh, community based. The whole reason they didn't sell drugs is because they didn't want a bunch of fucking junkies in right. their neighborhood and stuff. And they knew that. And that's why even the ones that like would allow that, still, if you got caught doing it in your neighborhood, right, right, you were still in some deep shit. Keep that shit away from here. Yeah. Like, well, no, that's the like a, that is a reason, and that's for sure the romanticized reason that they would say it is. I'm romantic. Well, you know, to make it like, oh, we're good guys and these drugs and they're bad, blah, blah. 
The real reason that most of the mob families were against selling drugs is because the time. You know, if you get caught with a gambling operation or beating a dude up, you know, you get your couple years and, and you're, you're out. out. Yeah. The drugs, <laughs> the time was so big. A lot, that's when people started Too much flipping. Of a risk. Yeah. So, you know, what you would make, yeah, you make a lot of money off drugs, but you yeah, run that gambling sense. operation, you do your three years, you're back on the streets and you're a fucking hero. You're doing that same amount of money in heroin. Yeah, you're gonna get fifty years, and you're yeah, gonna tell them fucking everybody. Do, yeah, because it's a lot easier to do that three, and then be like, you know, I don't have to say anything. And then when you come back, you have a higher stature. Whereas, I mean, twenty or thirty, forty years. Yeah, I mean, well, and also the politicians. So a lot of these people, this neighborhood shit, just like a lot like prohibition. Sometimes you turn, eh, whatever. You, you know, I'll turn my my head, place a little bet myself, something like that. Uh, but the yeah. drugs was something politicians. They couldn't couldn't fuck they, with it. They, they couldn't yeah. turn their back to it. Yeah, that makes sense. But so that was Bruno's operation. He brought on uh, Tommy as like an associate and basically taught him the ropes of the drug game. Tommy specialized in collections and enforcement. Mm. He loved <laughs> he loved karateing up street guys, <laughs> like for real. Like man, that's when they started calling him Tommy Karate because <laughs> that's how he would do it. <laughs> He'd just come at you out of nowhere with a chop. <laughs> A flying knee, flying foot. <laughs> yeah. Well, and, and it does it does seem like everything points to he was very, very fucking good at it. Yeah. And, you know, we're, and we're talking about drug dealers and cokeheads and shit like that. Yeah, I and mean, <laughs> the odds of them knowing karate is going to be... Uh, <laughs> now I have this little vision of just a coked up little David Lee Roth running around <laughs> high kicking motherfuckers. <laughs> That sounds, kicking people. that sounds great, actually. <laughs> That's right. And he had a high-pitched soft. Is this David Lee Roth? Yeah, is this is the story of David Lee Roth. This is so, Diamond Tommy Karate. So it's it's Steven Seagal. It's David Lee Roth. <laughs> yes, it's it's a little right. bit of all the stories. <laughs> nice. I mean, the karate probably helped, especially if you're really good, because he did have, like, the highest end of training, and he'd been doing it for a long time. But I think a bigger deal was the fact he was just, he was strong. He was strong, yeah. and he was in shape, and he knew how to fight, and he was comfortable with it. That's what they say a lot of times, like, boxers. You say, oh, they're good in a fight. Like, oh, because they punch a lot, duh, duh. That's just, it's really just a comfort level with that situation. All right. Okay. You, you know, a lot of people, you throw a punch at people, they start freaking the fuck out. They're not used to that. Right, yeah. You know, people that have that experience, they're... <laughs> Calmer in those situations, and well, yeah, absolutely. And going back to what I said about the state of MMA today, considering back then, like if you know karate, like you know any moves at all, and you're dealing with brawlers, you got any technique, much less this guy that went international, like was in Japan, like yeah. any technique at all, you're whooping these motherfuckers. Like even early UFC, if the people that knew a little bit of grappling was whooping all these brawlers' ass, oh yeah, yeah for sure, and, like. Nowadays, you go into, and you try like some simple karate, you're liable to get your ass smacked. But back then, if you're just dealing with a bunch of Italian meat, the second they go for like a double leg takedown and he just like smacks you in the face and eludes, you're like, what the fuck was this? Like, they're not ready even for after one of all that. these years. I'm still not even familiar with, with what just karate is. You know what I'm saying? Because <laughs> I'm exposed to so many different styles mixed together that yeah. when I look at pure, I don't even know what pure karate just looks like. There's not too many like pure. Martial, like people that stick with one thing, like I think yeah, one boxers. Discipline. Boxers are the only people that stick with boxing. Like other than that, if you know karate, you're bound to learn some jujitsu, some yeah. muay. You learn one other, you learn another. For sure. Well, and if you look, that's the progression of MMA. Like early MMA was style versus style. You know karate. I'm a wrestler. You're a boxer. I'm a this, and see which one's is better. Well, that brings in the mixed, right? Well, at first it was just verses. It right. was like you know it was just martial with, arts. But then it started to get mixed where you get, like, Matt Hughes, who's a college wrestler, but he realizes, okay, I got to learn how to box. Or a karate guy learns, like, you know, oh, I have to learn jujitsu. But now there's, like, a whole third generation. Like, GSP, he only knows all of them at the same time. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, I mean, that's the one big thing that MMA has done to the fight. Like, before then, UFC started as that, as a big hit. Like, which style is the best? That's what it started mm -hmm. with. Like, boxers be like, boxers are the best till you get takedown. Then you're a grappler, but you ain't got no strength. And, I mean, UFC really just proved... Kind of what uh, Bruce Lee did way back in the day. Learn all these styles. Yeah. Like, yeah, like let's put this. Uh, let's put this sumo wrestler against uh, a karate guy. Yeah, let's see how yeah. that works. It turns out it's like a rock paper scissors. Like, yeah, mm -hmm. if one style beats another, but then another style beats two. Like, well, and it's crazy because knowing what we know about now about fighting, you look at those fights and they're like, 
why is this fat sumo guy out there? Yeah, yeah, But at yeah. the time when we were watching it, like, oh, this guy's big as fuck. He's going to fight him that up. little guy. Dude, he's, he's going to beat like his ass. Got from Street Fighter. He's going to fight big, gigantic sumo wrestler. And I bet you that's Rahway, why. New Jersey. Yeah. <laughs> and I bet you that's why fucking uh, old Tommy was able to whoop so many people's asses. They just saw him as tiny and shit. And he just came out and said, I'll kick your ass. And he got him. <laughs> Yeah, they're just out there all doped up. I mean, they're really just like a bunch of goofballs that are trying yeah, to fucking I'm sure skip he had out a reputation too, because in that area, I'm sure it wasn't like you know. I'm sure word traveled fast that like oh, you oh yeah, watch so, out. So Tommy like, Karate's coming. Yeah, especially <laughs> once he got the name Tommy Karate, they probably yeah. just dropped Tommy. Like, Look out, it's Karate. Well, and we did start off by saying that this is a tight knit community, so anything right, that exactly. happens, so now you get to a point like, oh fuck, this motherfucker's gonna spin kick oh, me. Oh, he's shit. back from Japan. He thinks he's <laughs> tough, huh? Well, at this point, he's probably just hanging out in front of the stoops and shit, just doing backflips for no reason. Just, just, he kind of rose through the ranks quick. He was like a superstar because he was always down for whatever. You know what I'm saying? He loved the enforcement. He loved the muscle end, and he was kind of a rising star. And in 1978, at the age of 24. Uh, Tommy made his bones, which made him eligible to become an official member of the Banano family. Nice. So I did a little research on it, making their bones. So every mobster has to do a hit for the family before they can even be eligible to to join in. Right. A little blood in, blood out situation. Right. What's crazy is the progression of it, because, like, at one point, it used to just be you had to be in on a hit. So if they went to go do a hit and you were the driver or you were the lookout, so three dudes go and they kill a guy, bam, they all kind of made their bones. You know, they did this murder. And then later... So they changed that, and they're like, no, you actually have to kill the guy. (laughs) You you can't ride shotgun on bones. Yeah, (laughs) Well, and then they changed it to, it can't be some old shit, like some guy that you killed back in the day for some personal shit. It has to be no. who no. we tell you to. Oh, no. Okay. Oh, so, okay. Gotcha. So no shotgun and bones and no bones grandfathered in. Well, and the reason they did that was because Donnie Brasco almost got made. Like, they started to realize, like, well, dude, we got to tighten this up because... He could have just been a driver, never killed a guy, because if you're a cop, you can't do that. Right. And then now he gets made into the fucking family. That and makes now, sense. now and, and yeah, say, I mean that that's pretty bullshit. I'm just in the car, so like I get credit for this murder. Like yeah, fuck yeah. that. That's well and the other thing is if it wasn't it has to be who we tell you to, it can't be some old shit you did on your own. Because cops were good at just like they do with drugs and money. They just come up with a hit that got done and then just take credit for it. Like, yeah. oh, we'll just steer that one towards you. Yeah. See, this is one of those things is like it took them this long to change that rule. That seemed like that would be like I would think very quickly, all right, to get in, you have to kill someone. All right, it's someone we tell you to kill and you have to kill. I thought that's like, I'm sort of flabbergasted right now. Like, (laughs) how the hell is that? Like, why did it take that long for that to be a rule? That sounds very common sense to me. Well, they're not rocket scientists. I mean, they're fucking fucking Goombas. But at the same time, they also had like a level of trust. Because if if everybody's coming up from the same area, and I mean, I I don't know if it's a coincidence that this distrust came up around the same time as drugs started to get bigger. You know what I'm saying? Like, there's probably a lot of separation in between um, how the old way of doing shit and the new shit, because there's just a lot of obstacles that they didn't have to deal with before. Probably in the old days, policing was a lot different. Like, cops are usually like, you knew them and shit, and they worked your beat. Like, soon as, like... Other cops had to check those cops. Like, yeah, I bet you it was a lot. Like, before then, their snitching probably wasn't even a thing. Like, they weren't even that big into it. And now all of a sudden, it's like, oh, shit, we can't buy these guys off. And this guy's snitching. Yeah. Like, well, there's a lot of, sudden, of corruption, too. Because, you I mean, you figure, like, Serpico was in, like, you know, the early, early mm-hmm. 70s. So he's blowing the lid off of corruption. So before then, you know what I'm saying? Like, it was probably... Like yeah. the old west and shit. This is Serpico, Sur- huh? El Pacino, Serpico, yeah. <laughs> Frank Serpico. The real- hey, that's his a real cop, right? Yeah, that's a documentary. No, no Frank Serpico was a real yeah. cop. Yeah. Oh, was he? Yeah. 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 Oh, See, yeah. I don't do good guys. Oh, okay. <laughs> we do bad guys. I strictly research bad guys, apparently, because I had no fucking clue. I just thought, yeah, that's that El Pacino movie. Well, one of your bad guys will lead you to uh, Frank Serpico. <laughs> oh, I'm starting a new podcast. Say hello to the cop that doesn't play by your rules. <laughs> yeah. And it's just every 80s movie. <laughs> so in the early 80s, after he made his bones, within a couple of years, so fairly quick, because he was still in his 20s, which is very young, uh, the family consigliere. <laughs> for clearing that up. 
Well, I'm just saying, mobster wise, look, some yeah. motherfuckers could be in gangs for a long time. I mean, yeah. you could be in your 40s before you get made sometimes. You got to, you know, grind it out for a long <laughs> See, time. Who are you, Samuel Jackson, starting an acting career? Like, when, when you're uh, in your 40s and you're not made yet, just hang it up. Like, you're done. You're not a gangster. Just, just, just go get a job at the plant, dude. Yeah, you're <laughs> gangster adjacent. You're yeah. not, like, actually a gangster. Just wear a wife beater and beat your kids with a belt. That's like, true. how do you get, uh, yeah, how do you make it that far? Be like, you know, well, I guess today's my day. It's just so important. Like, if you're 40 something and you're still just an open mic comic, well, you're never going to be Eddie Murphy. Well, some of these guys do it their whole life because if you're not a full blooded Italian, I mean, some of these guys are lifelong criminals that work with these mobsters. And they could never get made, but they just, as long as you're connected with a crew, yeah, you're under that umbrella. You're just never, yeah. that means they can always, you're always open to get hit, you know, because if you're actually made, they need uh, permission to get you. People aren't allowed to put their hands on you. Yeah, you know, maybe so. at that point, it's just your fort, so you get seniored in. Like, you, that's that's not getting made, it's just getting senior rights. Frank Spiro nominated him in the early 80s, and he got made, and he was assigned to Frank Lino's crew first thing he did was start up his own drug operation and kind of bring in his own crew of associates to kind of work under him. He had, he had learned pretty good. He fucking crushed it with the drug operation and started raking in the money. Tommy loved being a made man. He compared it to a samurai, you know, because he was like, of course. oh, you know, you serve your master and you don't snitch and it's the family first. And right. He keeps on calling his capo sensei. <laughs> Don sensei. Don sensei. You feel? Well, I mean, you got to figure it's a lot like how, like, athletes translate well to the Army. You're, yeah. you're used to somebody telling you what to do. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, when I first read it, it sounded stupid, but when you kind of break it down, you're like, well, I mean, I guess being a mobster, there are some comparisons to that samurai life. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you have to be fighting for your purpose or whatever. Like, he probably felt very zen about it. Like, yes, this is my work, and I work for my family. So he uh, he married his high school sweetheart, a lady named Carol Bergoski, and had a son. And he felt like now he was now he's a made guy. It was really important to him to start off his reputation right off the bat as like a he wanted his name to be known that he was the fucking guy. He was he basically went looking for an opportunity to make an example. And there was a drug dealer named Tom Thomas Salerno, uh. who always paid but had a bad habit of paying late. So it might have worked, except he was looking to make an example. So even though he's still getting paid, he's like, you know what? I got to I gotta do something with one of these fuckers. So he took him for a ride in his car, killed him, stuffed him in his own trunk, and parked it in front of the Gravesend Cemetery, like a couple blocks from the house he grew up in, to set an example for the neighborhood that pay me late. This is what happens. <laughs> we'll bury you in your own car in front of the cemetery. Damn, man. What a way to go out. It's weird that he had to make an example when, like, people already know him. Like, he's already Tommy Karate. He's that little white dude flipping around. But you see, like, if you watch, you watch, you know, Sopranos, you see any of this stuff, it's like a different thing to them. Once you become, like, an official mob guy, you know, you got to start yeah. establishing your, res- you know, your reputation. Yeah. And, you know, he also wanted to separate himself from other mm-hmm. motherfuckers. Like, yeah, I know we're all badasses, but I'm for real. Yeah, the yeah. guy. Not only do you have to pay me, don't even pay me late, motherfucker. I will fucking kill you. This town's only big enough for one Tommy. (laughs) He became so feared like nobody would fuck with him. And he was pretty respected for his ability to get rid of people. To the point, uh, at one point, he ended up killing a gangster named Willie Boy Johnson, who was a lifetime friend of John Gotti. When John Gotti and Willie Boy Johnson... We're in trial together. He found out that Willie Boy had been snitching for 22 years. So he'd been oh. snitching from the 60s. And he found out when they got to trial and all these records get released. Damn. Damn. Your homie of 22 <laughs> years has been snitching the whole time. Well, and they say a lot of the reason uh, Willie Boy is half Indian. So his mom was Italian, but his dad was Indian. So, so they blamed it on that? Well, he could never be an official guy. Yeah. And he said, like, at one point, like, he had grew up with John Gotti. John Gotti was a little bit younger than him. Yeah. And then once, when John Gotti became a hot shot, he started, like, Willie Boy all of a sudden had to be his driver and shit. Ah, yeah. And he kind of just got, like, real bitter about... Oh, and then there was one time he did he did some time, and they were supposed to take care of his wife while he was locked up, ah. and they didn't. And that's when he actually was like, all right, fuck these guys. They had a chip on his mm-hmm. shoulders. Like, they ain't gonna look out for me, so... 
Hell hath no fury like an Indian scorn. Well, and they and what's weird is uh, they say that fucking of all the informants, he didn't ask for as much money. Like he didn't ask as much most informants did. Oh, and, he was he dry just, snitching. Yeah, he just wanted to do it. Yeah, he, yeah. he just really did like these dudes. Like, fuck these guys. Well, I mean, man. that's the that's a big part on everything when they're you're the mob or like a good corporate. You got to treat your workers good. Yeah. yeah, I mean, if you're not able to reap the benefits that everyone else is, you're not going to put in the same effort. Well, that's the big thing whenever you talk to anyone, like even bikers. Like, why are you like, because it's a family. We take care of each other. But like, if you're in that and then they don't take care of you, then yeah. you're like, well, then what the fuck am I yeah, here what for? am I doing here? I am currently in prison. Yeah. Are we not gonna, Are we not doing this or what? Right, right, I yeah. am. I mean, that's the big thing. Over money, over all that shit, if, like, you're supposed to be family taking care of. So, like, if they just didn't give him his cut or something, that's one thing. But, like, no, when I get locked up, you're supposed to take care of my family. That's, no. like, the way it is. Like, you don't do that. Like, What else are we doing here? Yeah. yeah. Tommy and a guy named Vincent Giattano, they killed Willie Boy Johnson in front of his Brooklyn home when he was walking out to his car. They shot him in each leg, twice in the back, and six times in the head. Dang. Uh, by request from John Gotti, or was it for something else? No, it specifically said it was a personal favor for John Gotti. Uh, yeah. And that's why they had Tommy Karate doing it, because it's one of these things, like, we look, we need, <laughs> we need someone good. <laughs> no, I got a question. He got all popular. He's the enforcer. He's crane-kicking motherfuckers up and shit. Now, he became an assassin. Now, what was his shit? He would just shoot people, or would he, like, karate them the fuck up? Well, I mean, I doubt he karate chopped them to death, so I'm I'm sure he shot them the fuck up, but, like... Well, early on, he started off shooting guys. Like, the first couple guys he shot. So, like, when he made his bones, he just rolled up, jumped out of his car, shot the guy and got back in the car and went... Tommy Salerno, we shot him in the car. So he's doing typical mob the shit. The classics. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Willie Boy, they wanted it in the street. They wanted John Gotti, they wanted him dead in the street. Mm. So they shot him up, and, they, and John Gotti wanted him shot in the head. Is it, hey, we hear you're uh, good at making examples. But as we move on, he will slowly get more creative with his, uh. his murder method. <laughs> oh, man, I can't wait. <laughs> so... Tommy bought two bars, and one of them he was running his operations out of, and it was a bar called Just Us, and it was a mob-only bar. And what he would do is if anybody came in that wasn't a connected guy, he would charge them $10 for a beer, and if they didn't leave, he would charge them more every time uh, until yeah. they finally left. <laughs> Catch the hint, bucko. Right, so you go in and get a beer, and they're like 10 bucks, and you're like, oh, shit, all right, give me another one, like 20 bucks. Yeah, and back then, <laughs> yeah, that's, st- that's a clear message back then. Like, go. Like, <laughs> beers were like a quarter. <laughs> yeah, that's what I was going to say. Ten bucks for a beer? That's ridiculous. Nowadays, yeah, back right then, now. it was like, ten grand for a beer? That That's 2020 strip club prices right there. Yeah, it seemed like a missed opportunity to change his nickname to Tommy Two Bars, too. Tommy Two Bars, that's good. You know what I mean? It's like, better than Tommy Karate. Yeah, a little bit. I mean, a it sounds bit, like he's bit, great. He's, he's done karate, and he's straight shooting people nowadays, so... Well, Tommy Two Bars is actually a good nickname. That's the problem is none of them ever have good nicknames. Right, well, right, yeah. let's be honest. There is good chance the there already is a Tommy Two Bars. True. Yeah. What the, what the, and, and he doesn't have two bars. <laughs> or there's a Tommy he's Three Bars. Two bars. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> there's a Tommy Three Bars. He's like, ah, what's the point? Yeah. He, he beat up a guy with a bar in each hand. Yeah, there you <laughs> go. Like, oh, there you go. <laughs> well, two when bars. you first say he bought two bars, I was thinking like, oh, is that like ninja weapons? What's he doing? No, two actual establishments. Nice. Two saloons. An entrepreneur. Now, his wife, Carol, everything that he liked, she didn't. So she wasn't cool. <laughs> like, so she was his high Typical school Typical marriage. She was his high school sweetheart, so she was down, like, she married this guy, but then as he turned into a big drug dealer and a killer and then a man that was feared on the streets, all of a sudden, she she wasn't cool with that. You knew I was into karate. <laughs> you knew this when we met. Carol couldn't deal with the lifestyle, and she divorced him. But that's, then, that's one, real quick, that's just one thing that happens in the mob all the time. Like, what do these women think when they start dating a dude in the mob? It's either don't start dating a dude in the mob 
or quickly become accustomed, this oh, dude's yeah. going to do mob well, shit. It's just like in any profession, though. It's like a girl dating a rapper. It'd be like, you know, oh, it's exciting at first, but then after a while, I'd be like, are you going to continue doing that rap shit? Like, why don't you get a real fucking job? <laughs> or at least rap- I, I, I met you backstage. Yeah, I met you, you, yeah, I met you at a fucking show. What but are you see, talking about? That's at least so. like, when you rap, you you can if you one day be like, hey, I don't know if I want to rap anymore. You can outgrow it. Like when you're <laughs> yeah, in the you mob, like yeah, yeah. I shoot people in the face. <laughs> yeah. So it's kind of my move. Yeah, it's kind of my thing. You're you know? kind of down with it, yeah, or yeah. you ain't. Like no. that's craziness. When and that's like a common thing with like. Once again, I'm going back to just mob movies that I've seen. Like, what the fuck is Sharon Stone's problem? Robert De Niro, sweet. But, like, every, like, a mob, like, another fictional one, Carmela from The Sopranos. Like, I hated her every single, like, you married Tony Soprano, you dumb yeah, bitch. Yeah. You didn't think he's going to fuck hookers and stab people in the face? Well, I mean, maybe he was a real sweetheart. I said, look, I don't always shoot people. Sometimes I just sell heroin. Yeah, I mean, you know, you know. I'm, not, I'm not always fucking like, a horrible on. human. Yeah, it's I, reasonable. I, I mean, I really don't understand. Sometimes I only poison the community. Yeah. It's not all murders and karate yeah. kicks. I mean, like, come on. That is funny, though, and that is a, that's just an old complaint that just, it was old then. It's, it's still old now. It just doesn't make sense. It's yeah. like you married into it. You knew what was going on before you came in. I mean, it's the whole live by the sword, die by the sword. If you married into it, you should still know that's the rule. Or like anything, whenever people, I don't know, it's just, yeah, they're, people get mad when tigers do tiger shit. Right, it's exactly. a tiger. Exactly. 100%. So a- after Carol divorced him, he met a lady named Celeste Lepardi, who was a Brooklyn socialite, and she was very down with the mob life. She was all about that shit. A lot of people say... Like if she was if she was a dude, that she probably would have been a mobster or something. But she was a like a real party girl. She liked a la party. Everybody said that like she was a fucking uh, like this real hot and stuff like that. I seen a picture. She kind of just looks like a regular chick. But then again, it is old. You know, like it's a mob back- seven. <laughs> <laughs> she's a mob five. Right? Well, I mean, but that's a great. No, she's a mob ten. I was gonna she's say that's like a, grave- a regular six. A regular six would be a Gravesend ten. Be like, once you take all the hairspray out and her hair is only like six inches off the top of her head, then it's not so hot. Yeah, they like their own style. It's, like, a, a, it's like the mafia version of uh, uh, I'm going to get you sucker when the lady starts taking oh, off yeah, her yeah, hair yeah, yeah. And, yep. and her leg and shit. Prosthetic leg. Like, she's wearing three different kinds of cheetah print. <laughs> she's wonderful. And about the same time that he met Celeste, he also met a low-level associate named Frank Ganji, who he kind of took under his wing... The way Bruno had kind of took him under his wing nice. and kind of made him, you know, his understudy or whatever. His apprentice. All right. Well, what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead. We're going to take a quick smoke break, refill our drinks. We'll be back in a minute. listening just real quick want to ask you to subscribe to us on your favorite podcast app go to apple itunes give us a five-star rating and leave us a review and we'll read it on the show
If you have any questions, comments, or a guy that you would recommend we cover, you can email us at say hello to the bad guy podcast at gmail.com. We also want to thank Sixfo Sueno for letting us use his music in the intro. You can subscribe to him on YouTube and also a friend of the show, Cancer. He's got an art, photography, and graphic design page at Eyes Bleed Defiance on Instagram. You can see a lot of his work, including our cover art, which he designed. And he also performed the mid-show song, Blood, from his album, Grenades, Pistols, and Rape Whistles. Now back to the show. Now that Tommy had a new old lady and a new dude under his tutelage, he was back on track. June 1987, Tommy decided he wanted to show Frank Gangy the ropes. So he goes and picks him up one day and says, take a ride with me. And Frank says, he, he said he thought they were going to get coffee. Mm-hmm. They stop by one of the other crew members' house. They pick up plastic bags, a suitcase, a hacksaw, a gun, and a silencer. For coffee, yeah. For coffee. Yeah, yeah just some coffee. How do you get coffee? I mean, fine. <laughs> That's how I get coffee, but I'm a serial killer, so. So uh, they go to the apartment of a guy named Talal Sisik, who was a Middle Eastern drug dealer. And Tommy just had a feeling he was an informant. And okay. <laughs> it's a weird feeling. Just, nah, I got a feeling. He talks funny. It right? wasn't, wasn't because he was Middle Eastern that they thought <laughs> no, he was. No, not at all. Oh, okay. not, yeah, no. It could, couldn't be. Like, he just. No, nah, I mean, a very so, diverse, diverse neighborhood. Tommy shot him twice in the head at Point Bank Range. He told Frank, I'm going to show you how we get in my crew. This is how we dispose bodies. Wow. So he took Talal's body, threw him in the tub, and turned on the water to drain the blood down. Tommy took off all his clothes, folded them up real neat, and put them his off to the side. His own clothes or the... His the, own clothes. Oh, okay. So he took off his own clothes, folded them off, put them to the side, got in the tub with the body, and used the hacksaw to cut it into six pieces. He always went with six pieces. Head, torso, both arms, both legs. This right. story could have went a thousand different ways. <laughs> all right. Depending it, on your Pornhub search it's history. It's very hurting when you go, so he started chopping up the body. Thank God. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so... Then I'm going to show you what we do to these bodies. He yeah, ran- that was the least creepy solution, or the <laughs> least creepy uh, outcome. Hacks on a body while you're naked in the tub with it is still fairly creepy. Oh, no, it is, but... <laughs> well, I mean, if you're going to hack up business. a body, how do you do it? You know what I mean? Well, like... Oh, I'm sorry. I thought you were asking See, the question. <laughs> it sounds like uh, he didn't really think this guy was a snitch at all. He just wanted to do the exam. He just wanted to show a homeboy how, what they do with uh, bodies. Well, I mean, he did that with the guy earlier, right? Where he's like, look, yeah. I'm, I'm looking to kill one of you, so the first one to slip up. Yeah. See, so. this was so funny. He's a sociopath. Like, it's just... Ah, uh, today in class, we're just going to teach this dude something. Like, the Talal guy wasn't even a part. He's just a reason, like, ah, oh, I got to teach my student this. Just shut up, Talal. You'll be all right. Yeah, yeah, okay. Just, just like go along nothing. with it. Yeah. yeah. After after the, he waits all the blood drain, wrap up the body parts in plastic, and then cram them all into one suitcase. Then stay in the tub, take a shower, and then get back, take his unfolded clothes and get back dressed. So did Frank have to watch all of that? Or did he get to go in the other room while I took the shower? <laughs> he, watched, he watched him undress He's like, once. I got everything but the shower part. Can you do that again? Well, he had to do everything twice because Frank kept on asking him slower. <laughs> <laughs> well, Frank actually had an issue with the body part. So at one point, Tommy told him just go get the car around. And Frank went uh, and got a bottle of liquor and slammed it. To get the car around just because he's like, fuck, dude. Yeah. And then, so when Tommy was done. It's a rough day at work. (laughs) (laughs) You know what I'm saying? God damn, I thought we were getting coffee. Yeah, I thought we were getting coffee today. Maybe beat up some people. And once he had the bodies killed and in the suitcase and wrapped up how I wanted, he fucking unfold his clothes, put them back on. And they they would go to eat at uh, L and B Spumoni Gardens, which is a pizza spot in Brooklyn. I actually been there. I haven't been. I barely been to Brooklyn, and I be, before I even no heard way. this story, awesome. I have been there. It's cool. It's not like uh, New York style pizza, like okay. a fold in long. It's like more like Detroit pizza, like squ- it's like square, okay. thick crust pizza and shit. Yeah. Word. I would have enjoyed it more when I was there. I mean, I still took my picture next to like the Sopranos dudes, but <laughs> I'm like, hey, where's the Tommy? Where's the Tommy, Tommy Karate yeah, spot? Yeah, I want Tommy Karate's booth. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, after, once he died, we karate chopped it in half. Nobody gets to sit in that booth. You're like, no, it's that suitcase over there, but you got to sit in it naked. <laughs> <laughs> no matter what is involved, you got to get naked at some point yeah. in this process. Well, you know? I mean, old Frank, fuck it. Like we said, uh, his old lady, like. It's the mob life. You don't want to. You yeah. don't want to chop up bodies. You better get the fuck on. I mean, he knew you were hanging out with Tommy Karate, right? Yeah, exactly. Like you knew his reputation. What do you think was going to happen? You guys are just going to keep going to get coffee for sure. He was like, man, 
He told his wife when he left, I'm going to get coffee with Tommy Cry. All right, you're going to end up chopping somebody up, though. <laughs> yeah. No, he would bury all of his bodies at the Davis Wildlife Refuge in Staten Island because it was federally protected. So the thing that these mobsters always worry about when they dig up bodies is that land gets developed. Right. And they yeah. bring in the construction crews, and that's yeah. when they find them. For sure. So since it was federally protected, he knew it could never be, they could never do construction. And then it had like those. Uh, swampy, like, soil, so it was easier to dig. Wow. And he liked to dig his holes extra deep so that, like, the dogs couldn't find them. <laughs> and he also thought, like, the super wet Man. soil would help, like, de- decay the bodies faster. See, Makes sense. This is what's so great. Like, earlier, we can just make fun of meathead Italians, and we do it a lot, but, like, they know they're, like... The mob didn't get rich by being just dummies. Like, they, you know, the last people we did were some bikers. They just threw bodies in the river. Like, that was their <laughs> shit. Yeah. Like, these people knew federal land. Like, the mobs were as much as just being dumb meatheads and shit. Like, they knew their shit. They're, they're good at their job. <laughs> they, you, yeah. you, you don't start a giant criminal enterprise. R- by, exactly. I may not be a smart man, <laughs> but I know how to hide a body. <laughs> so, 100%. Um, his old lady, Celeste, her social life eventually led to drug addiction. And Tommy, oh, Celeste, that's the name of a mobster's <laughs> girlfriend. Well, he, Tommy hated drugs because he sold drugs. So he liked to kill drug dealers and beat them up, and, or like okay. people that did drugs. He never did drugs. He just sold them. And he's right. seen what drugs would do. So he fucking hated them. What a purist. Hey, whatever, don't get high in your own supply. He lived it. And that's why he was good at it, maybe, because he didn't yeah. do the drugs. I'm sure. He he told her not to do it, and he ever, even went as so far he'd go personally tell dealers, "Do not sell Celeste drugs. If you see Celeste, it, do not yeah. sell the drugs." Or I'll so kill you. I, I made the reference earlier, but this bitch is Sharon Stone and Casino. Yeah, even though people wouldn't sell her drugs, her best friend Phyllis Birdie would supply the drugs to her. And Tommy <laughs> says, Phyllis "Birdie, that bitch Shocker. is gonna sing. Shocker, <laughs> she's gonna snitch." I already caught Phyllis Birdie. Oh, that's definitely a snitch. That sounds like the name of someone that's going to tattle. Yeah, a little bit. They weren't supposed to hang out, but whenever Tommy wasn't around, Celeste would go hang out with Phyllis anyways. (laughs) Now, now one time on September 10th, 1987, Phyllis and Celeste went out partying all night and doing coke all day. When she got back to the house, she went back to Phyllis's apartment, and since she'd been doing so much coke all night, she couldn't fall asleep. (laughs) That seems to happen. So she figured she'd take a little heroin to fucking take the edge off and help her sleep. I mean, the All logic right. checks out, you know. I mean, good old spe- Did she invent the speedball? <laughs> speed this whole story has been a diversion. We're just learning yeah. about the invention of the speedball. the history of the speedball. Well, as speedballs tend to do, she didn't make it. Well, you know. Say it ain't so. Celeste, who's a grown-ass woman who is forbidden to hang out from another grown-ass woman because they don't know how to act. So that means she Birdie's OD'd? probably not going to make it either. Phyllis Birdie sometimes fucked around with Frank Ganji, and they would hang out sometimes. Oh, okay. So Frank Ganji was the first one to find out that Celeste had died. So he had to tell Tommy she's dead. Oh, Tommy's and, gonna be pissed. He's not gonna like that. Well, and people say, like, as psychopathic and as fucked up as Tommy, people say that he may have been a sociopath or a bunch of things, but that he could never be a true psychopath because everybody says it seems like he truly loves Celeste. Oh, God. Which yeah. psychopaths can't really do. Right. So, you know, he could be a high end sociopath, mm-hmm. but he really seemed to fucking dig Celeste. So, Frank had to tell her or tell him that Celeste was dead. Ouch. And when Tommy showed up, Tommy showed up, and she was already dead at Phyllis's apartment, and the cops were already there. And he smacked the shit out of Phyllis in front of the cops, <laughs> and the cops had to throw him out. They didn't arrest him. It's probably like you were talking about earlier. That's that back-in-the-day small neighborhood shit. Like, hey, like, I don't condone it, but I understand. Hey, whatever. Not me, them. I'm sorry. Well, right. I'm sorry. Yeah, they're like, hey, <laughs> that's what they said. <laughs> but, I mean, I, I get like, I told you not to hang out with her now. She's OD. Smack. Yeah. Like, Whatever he spit, lucky you didn't get karate chopped to the throat. Yeah, it could have been way worse. <laughs> so Tommy put like an APB out. He said everybody's got to find Phyllis Birdie, find Phyllis, Bur- find Phyllis Birdie, and bring her to me. Oh, so she flew the coop. Ooh. <laughs> I'm sorry. I, I, th- no, I think we should just specifically just sit here and see how many <laughs> bird puns. fucking bird puns we could do. Yeah. So Tommy sent out all the messenger pigeons. Oh man. 
They're getting worse. We should wrap it up yeah. before we just, oh. just slide and slow. He better yeah, we get her put this in a cage. <laughs> yeah. He better get her before the cops do. She's going to sing like a canary. There you go. So one day Frank Gandhi's at a bar and he sees Phyllis Birdie and he's like, hey. Birds of a feather. So you should probably get the fuck out of here. <laughs> Tommy's going to kill you. And Phyllis Birdie's like, oh, I'm not going to leave or whatever. Oh, yeah, it's just Tommy. <laughs> right. He's it's, just murdered a bunch of fucking people. I, I, can deal, I can deal with well, him. In all fairness, Phyllis is probably bigger than him. I haven't I seen know. a picture, but I'm going to have to say you're I mean, probably right. Some people think that the reason she didn't leave was she thought, like, the mob thing, they're not supposed to kill women or whatever. Ah. Uh, but I think she's just a, a, a crazy person, really. I mean, we all, it sounds she's like she's girl. just a coke cord and you know, she's like, fuck it, fuck Tommy. I'm going to get hair out of here if I want to hair out of here. Fuck him. I think that's a quote. Phyllis Birdie yeah, said yeah. that. I like, that's I read she, that. That's I what read that. That's in your notes. <laughs> or maybe she wanted to die because uh, her and her best friend, like her best friend, OD'd with her. Maybe like, I'm just a cokehead too. Yeah, she probably me. just didn't take him. Yeah. She didn't. She thought she was safe. Probably like you said, the whole. Um, she just thought wouldn't mess with a woman. I mean, I can't get into the mind of a coke whore. That's God's work. <laughs> you know what I mean? But not only that, you would think like, okay, if they were trying to be, uh, if we're gonna get movie on it, then Frank would have to kill her. Right. You know what I'm saying? In the movie version, Frank would be the one. They'd be like, okay, well, you want to prove your loyalty to us. You got to kill her. Oh, he's already halfway through sipping that fifth in preparation. <laughs> it's like, fuck. Her and Ganji went back to his apartment, and uh, they just did coke and fucked for two days. And right. Ganji <laughs> said— that's, that's one way to do it. That's an option. So Ganji said he thinks at one of the mornings they went back out to get more coke— he thinks somebody at the Coke spot was one of Tommy's guys uh, that seen him there. And the next morning when he woke up, Tommy called him. So he's sitting in his house and he's got Phyllis in the other room and he answers his phone and it was Tommy. And he said he knows Tommy's a smart guy and he feels like if he's calling, he's got to know something. Right. So he says, hey, Tommy, I got her. So I got her here for you. Oh, and, man. <laughs> so Tommy shows up and he shot Phyllis twice in the head. Dismembered a body like the typical style. Naked. She's the only body that he buried five pieces of. <laughs> Once again, that was a very weird pause. <laughs> that could have went a hundred different ways. That was the only body that uh five pieces. Well, he kept her head in his freezer for two years. Well, I mean, you know, that's as one well, is after standard. Do. Yeah, that'll wow. happen. That'll happen. Um, but so you don't do serial killers because it's too dark, huh? He right. domered her. So, <laughs> yeah, straight up. So, <laughs> you keep her dick in a jar, too? <laughs> After that, Tommy actually, like, appreciated Frankie, or Frank Ganji. Like, that became, like, his right-hand man. He was like, fuck yeah, if I could trust one person, I mean, you give Frank a guy, Ganji. You give him credit for seizing an opportunity. <laughs> like, he's like, hey, I, I mean, really, that's quick on his feet. You're like, what else are you going to do? Like, fuck it, I got her for you. Clearly, he wasn't in, in, as in love with her as Tommy was, was with, with Celeste. Celeste. Yeah. Tommy was never the same after that. People said he went from, well, they went from, he went from scary to dark. So he was always a scary dude, but he got to a point where. Well, he does have a head in his freezer. Right. Well, and even like his own crew, like people wouldn't leave or people wouldn't go anywhere because they were afraid of him. Not because they were down with him anymore. They're just like, fuck, what is, oh, wow. what is Tommy going to do? You got to be on the watch out. Emo Tommy's going to get you. And. Damn, he went full Joker. Like less than a month later, he stabbed a guy named uh, Merrick Kucharski. Uh, he stabbed him to death in a disagreement over money. And then, Why would you disagree with Tommy? Like, whatever. Less than a month after, like, his old lady OD'd and he chopped off this other, like, you don't mess with Tommy about money right now. Yeah, just give him what he's asking yeah, for. Yeah, give him what he wants. Uh, he killed another one of his crew members, uh, Joseph Balsano, who he thought was uh, snitching. He stabbed him with an ice pick, shot him in the head, and slit his throat. That's it? <laughs> well, I, mean, I mean, he makes sure the job's done. Yeah, I mean, that's a uh, man. Um, on March 15th, 1989, two more of his crew members, uh, Richard Leone and Solomon Stern, he thought they were informants. And he called him. He called them to one of his clubs, and they came up because everybody's afraid of Tommy. So they're like, oh, fuck, we better go see what's going on. Oh, man. Is he, he tortured them both. He shot Richard Leone so many times. You, you know the cowboy thing where they shoot at your feet to make you dance? Yeah. He was doing that. But instead of shooting at his feet, he was just shooting them on the left and right side <laughs> just to make them, like, fall back and forth. I told you, cha-cha! 
man. I don't think that's how the cowboy dance thing works. No, no, that's see, not at all. that's just lazy killing. You that's just want to kill people, but you're just gonna do people in your own crew. Like, go what, kill other people, Tommy. What was the name of the other guy? Solomon what? Solomon Stern. That's another great fucking name, God man. Damn. Solomon Stern. Stern. That's a, that's a gangster. That's a, that's a great name, Solomon Stern. They called him Jib Jib. <laughs> that was his name. Trip, trip. Well, with yeah. the alliteration, that's that would be like the real name of a Marvel, like yeah, a, a Marvel no, character's alias. Yeah, 100%. Solomon Stern. Stan Lee's and fucking spinning in his grave. Like, why didn't I think of Solomon Stern? Fuck, why didn't I get that one? That is a great name. <laughs> so, April 1990, Frank Ganji was arrested for drinking and driving. So he was looking at very little time, possibly <laughs> yeah. a ticket. Yeah, back then. <laughs> yeah, that was a slap on the wrist for sure. But he opted. Now, what he says is when he was sitting in the cell, and I guess some of it probably checks out because he wasn't facing much time. And he said he was sitting there and he just couldn't handle, like, he came from kind of a mob family, had been around it his whole life. But he's kind of like, man, this is some next level kind of gross shit. Oh, okay, yeah. You know, he called in a detective and snitched on, he confessed to five murders and snitched on Tommy Karate. For drunk driving? For drunk driving, yeah. This fucking idiot. <laughs> so we were talking earlier about fucking doing three years for yeah, this I mean, or like, drug time. Drug driving, like you could have 20 like, of them back then. Yeah. Hey, you want to blow on this? All right, kill five people. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. You want Tommy Karate? I yeah. got him. I'll give you Tommy Karate. I'll give you John Gotti. Like, so it's you're just AB. a ticket, sir. It's a parking ticket. I got John Gotti. There's some neighborhood cop like, hey, you don't want to do that. Yeah, yeah. I'll be like, listen, guy. <laughs> so your ABC's backward. Z, Y. He got that bitch head in his freezer. Yeah. Like, <laughs> like, I mean, like... Uh, see, uh, this is what's bad about the mob, too. They need to have a better chain of command because if there was a way, Frank could have just went to Tommy Karate's boss and just be like, hey, man, there's an issue here. <laughs> but they don't do that. If he would have done that, that guy would have just went to Tommy Karate. Hey, you know, you got uh, your people working under you uh, aren't happy with you. Like, there's no way for him to... So it's either I dry snitch on Tommy or eventually he's going to shoot me in the head which goes by, like, the first rule of being in the mob or being a biker, being in a gang or anything is you're supposed to be the family. Take it. As soon as you start right. cannibalizing your own, then it's all done for. Well, not only that, but, like, when are you going to prove yourself? If you have to kill one person in order to prove yourself, after you've killed five, it's generally, uh, you know, it, nobody has to worry about you. Right. Especially Especially for just getting pulled over <laughs> for drunk driving. driving. You know what I'm saying? Like, that's just... Yeah. Like, you, well, you that, that's why you have shit on your the, trust. That's why you have them make your bones. Yes, so that exactly. you know you can trust this guy. We're going to stop, take a step back and just build the narrative. Maybe, like you said, he was in that neighborhood. I mean, when you're from these neighborhoods, you got no choice. If he was raised in that neighborhood, then it's like, yeah. well, I'm going to have to be against you. And the fact that his first kill, he, like, went out, got drunk and all this shit. Like, he probably just weren't built for this shit, but because it's all he knew, he was he stuck, stuck in this around. shit. Yeah. Right. What, so, what else am I going to do? Yeah, yeah. From the very beginning, he wasn't built for this shit, and it finally probably just came to a head where he's like, I don't know. So, like you said, he would have confessed to anyone. He was just waiting for the opportunity to, to tell somebody. Somebody catch me, yeah, please. Somebody, please. I got to well, get this off my shoulders. I mean, this is the whole problem with uh, the whole... Well, I mean, I'm not in the mob, so I don't know if it's the problem. But the, that's the problem with the whole made man thing is, like, he's got no choice. He can't go nowhere to mm. be like, hey, this guy's a dick. There's a, almost like Robert De Niro in Casino. I don't know why I keep going back to that fucking movie. <laughs> but, like, Joe Pesci, that dude, Tommy. He There's was, no one you can't yeah, tell on. He was going, and Robert De Niro even said, like, he went to the people above Tommy and be like, yeah, this guy's kind of reckless. Like, yeah, he's a made man. What are you going to yeah, do? Gonna like, do? fuck it. So they dry snitch. So on June 3rd, 1990, while Tommy was sitting at a traffic light, the DEA agents crashed into his car, dragged him out of the car, threw him face first, and arrested him. Damn, they were fucking around. Well, they said he was always known to be heavily, he, they were yeah, scared they of him. he was dangerous. Yeah, yeah, and he was a scary guy. So they actually came up with that plan on the fly. They had followed him, and they were pulling up to him. When he's at the light, they were like, Look, if we just walk up on him, he's going to be, so he's yeah. like, dude, I'm going to crash into him. And then you guys get them. No, they're going to say it's all played. All the heavens and one dude was in the driver's seat all pumped up. Do, 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 do. Go yeah. get this. The guys in shock are like, hey, we're coming up on them. Hey, you going to slow down? You Whiskey gonna, throttle. You're going to yeah. hit those brakes? You know the, America! And then he just crashes into them like, son of a bitch. I thought we were going for coffee. No. <laughs> yeah, again. 
So when they arrested him, they had to, they searched the Davis Wildlife Refuge for they spent two days with dogs and the equipment and everything they could use, and they couldn't come up with anything. So then they spent another two days. They came up with the idea to take like giant poles, mm-hmm. like seven foot poles, and walk shoulder to shoulder, and every couple feet put uh. the pole down into the ground. They did that for four days. <laughs> they eventually pulled up six bodies, which included Phyllis Birdie, Merrick Kucharski, Richard Leone, Solomon Stern, and Talal Sisek. Wow. Damn. They were all cut up into pieces in uh, suitcases under the ground. Oh, With- <laughs> At least he went fancy. Like, none are in garbage bags. They're <laughs> all in suitcases. Suit- that's his style. He was particular. When they, when they searched his house, they found 60 firearms. And then, like, a bunch of books on anatomy and shit like that, like anatomy and surgery. And he had pieces of jewelry or pieces of something from everybody he killed, which they all said they never see that. That's a serial killer trait, and they've never seen that, like, for mobsters. Mobsters don't do that shit, typically. Yeah, this guy seems very serial killer-esque. Three French hens, two turtle doves, and a birdie <laughs> head yeah. in the freezer. Yeah, as soon as you start taking trophies and shit, like, yeah. Yeah, that that is... Different. No. And what year was this again? Uh, he got caught in 1990. Oh, okay. So yeah. he ripped through the 80s mostly. This is 1990. Okay. They charged him with a bunch of charge, a uh, bunch of drug charges, and seven murders. He <laughs> end, he ended up. He was convicted of everything but the Willie Boy Johnson murder. They convicted him on uh, the drug charges. And, <laughs> so he beat a rap. He beat yeah one of them. See, still to this day, Indians can't get no justice. And that <laughs> one, and that oh well, I'll let you finish because I don't know where he ends up. At one point, when Frank Ganji was testifying and he was talking about the Phyllis Birdie murder, and he started crying, so the judge called a break. And when they went to break in session in court, Tommy Karate told him, "Are you happy with yourself, you fucking crybaby?" <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that's awesome, oh, man. That's awesome. <laughs> Are you fucking happy? Well, I'm thinking about that too. I'm like, dude, you fuck this dumb cohort that got in. The, like, got these other things. Like, you're crying over. I see all kinds of stupid quotes in this stuff, and that's yeah. kind of the funniest shit. Like that, in court, like, you fucking yeah. cry, baby. Because I mean, this guy sounded like he was. I mean. I don't want to say he's weak because I don't know if I'm going to stand around while somebody's chopping up somebody else's body. But then again, I wasn't born into this shit. This was like he's in weak the for so a mobster. It just sounds, yeah, it sounds like he was never cut out for this shit from the get go. Yeah, he and, just was uh, in that neighborhood. He got caught up. No. So he ended up getting. At one point, they're going to try the death penalty. He asked some of the DEA agents that arrested him, the guy that crashed into his car. They asked him, he said, so if, they, if I get the death penalty, how they kill me? And they said, well, we'll do a lethal injection. And he said, why can't we just have this guy shoot me? <laughs> <laughs> oh, now you're not afraid of violence, <laughs> right. you pussy. He got, he got off the death uh, sentence, though, so he just ended up doing life in prison. He was convicted to life, and he is still alive today doing his time in Allenwood, Pennsylvania. Oh, Damn. All right, so I can write him a letter. <laughs> Indeed. He's, he's in his self shadow boxing right now. All right, Tommy Karate, a letter. <laughs> See, that just goes to prove he didn't do karate since he was like 20. He like was straight chopping people up, stabbing people, like shooting people in the face. But still, he's Tommy Karate. Like, that, you fucking karate chop someone one time when you're 20. That <laughs> that's name's just fucking like Those six. nicknames stick, man. <laughs> oh, yeah. So that's the story of Thomas Tommy Karate Patera. So say goodnight to the bad guy. Go on. The last time you're going to see a bad guy like this again, let me tell you. Tommy Karate is great. Now we got to cast it. So while I was telling the story, we haven't seen a picture of him yet. So say we're going to cast a movie right now about Tommy Karate. And I have the pictures. So if you have a pre guess before we could do it, who would you pick? To, who would you cast to play Thomas Patera in a movie about his life? Right, I'm going to go see. crazy and I'm going to go little Tom Holland. I'm going to go Spider Man. Just okay. that little dude. Old Tom Holland. I can see him ch- jumping around, chopping people, and being pissy. Let's see. I would say either. Hmm. Yeah, that's a tough one. Because so I can think of like his fighters and wrestlers. Uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm just like trying to CM Punk and small shit. athletes. <laughs> like I'm, young I'm, CM Punk and shit. I'm trying to think of tiny people that can play like psychotic but still be little but still be like, oh, I don't want to punch this guy. Like a young Joey or a young uh, Joe Pesci. Like someone that like. 
You yeah. just look at him like, I want to fight this dude, but he's still... It I'm, seems like something that Joseph Gordon-Levitt would want to make for himself <laughs> and make himself star in it. But it would fuck it up and it'd be like the new Gotti movie. Yeah, like it's, exactly. a, it's the Nest Zero on Rotten exactly. Tomatoes it movie. Like, or even like Zac Efron you know, trying to play Ted Bundy. Go fucking Shire LaBeouf. Shire Shia LaBeouf, I, anytime it's a smaller, crazy guy, I always tend to go with Ben Foster. So yeah. I know. Yep. But see, ben I don't Foster, know, Ben Foster sure. is probably bigger. He well, probably aged out probably, too. Yeah. Well, here's the picture. Here's a Tommy Karate. So. Oh, good God. Now, this is him. You can see his face is smashed in from <laughs> when they arrested him. All right. What's and the these name are of pictures the, of him and Celeste. What's the name of the pug that played Frank in Men in Black? That's who I have played. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there we go. Uh, yeah, that's, um, yeah, I can't think of anybody. Uh, young James Gandolfini would have probably played him. Or his son now, who's playing Ooh, him. You know what? Him. I can't think of his Michael. name, but he played uh, Al Capone in Boardwalk Empire, and he's been in a bunch of shit. He's a tiny, he's an English actor. Well, so who yeah. I was thinking of, and we can't do it, but if we could pick of all time, because he's passed away. Yeah. But have you guys ever seen the movie Best of the Best? Best of oh, the best. Yeah. The karate, the karate Air, movie. Yeah, I yeah. think Chris Eric Penn. Roberts. Chris, Chris Penn. Chris okay. Penn yep. from uh, yeah, could have played. Penn. Chris Penn could play him. I mean, Chris Penn does the crazy gangster thing. He doesn't thing. look too small and wiry, though. He's he doesn't. The, that's weird. He looks more stocky. Yeah. He looks like uh, in Snatch. He looks like Tommy from Snatch. Oh, yeah. I think that's the guy. I think that's the same dude. Oh, probably. Yep, yeah, that that is him. His name is Stephen Graham. Really? Yeah, yeah, there you go. I didn't know who it was, but as soon as yeah. you said that, I put that together. Yep, absolutely. Yeah, this dude, Stephen Graham. Yep, that's Stephen him. Graham. Yep. Yeah, that's him. Yep, Tommy from. See, and I knew he was in. I always think of him Al Capone awesome. from that. But yeah, Tommy from fucking. So Finch. what's it? What was his name? Uh, Stephen Graham. Graham. So yeah. we're gonna take Stephen Graham. We're gonna get him with uh, Anderson Silva as a technical advisor, <laughs> <laughs> and we're gonna do this bitch right and get him out there. Now I gotta oh, show yeah. you these because these are my favorite pictures that I found of Tommy Karate. Now that he's in uh, prison, yeah. So there's Tommy Karate doing the splits in prison. <laughs> and there's I Tommy remember, Karate. With he's, the- a, he's a big <laughs> man in that picture too. Like he's doing the splits, but. His upper body sitting on a couch. Good and, lord! And he's an older guy, and he's still so. I mean, he he was real on his karate shit. Well, I mean, he's yeah. in prison now. Like, I, I mean, bet I'm you sure he's that comes just, in handy. Yeah, I'm sure he's just doing karate like all day now. I bet you that's or just shit. doing the splits all day. Well, yeah. dude, or splitting <laughs> something all day when he's not when he's not slicing his garlic really really thin I, <laughs> with a razor. I'm, I'm assuming Tommy Karate probably doesn't stress in prison a lot. <laughs> like, he probably... Probably not, especially since the no. one that he wasn't convicted of was that... Uh, the Willie Murder Boy Dan- Johnson. Yeah, the Willie Boy Johnson. So that probably got him a lot of uh, a lot of coverage in there. I don't know, but I mean, it seems like it would. I really like the picture, after telling that whole, hearing that whole story of him with two pictures he painted of hummingbirds. Of course, man. All all horrible criminals love to paint cute shit like George <laughs> that W. Seems Bush. To be it. George W. Bush and fucking Scotty, Tommy Karate. So early, earlier you said, uh, so I could write him a letter. You could buy his art. I don't know. You could buy some does, Tommy does Karate the, uh, art. Do the proceeds go to, like, um, charity? Or, <laughs> like, or they go to Phyllis Birdies? <laughs> no. The, the I'm charity not buying goes this guy ramen. <laughs> no, it goes towards karate lessons for inner city youths. <laughs> He's gonna like, yeah, I'm not going to support his uh, chili lime ramen <laughs> fucking uh, what? addiction. What the hell is going on here, though? How does his head get misshapen? Uh, these Because they're bad prison pictures, so they're just stretched out different for the fucking, uh, <laughs> to be able to put in the format. So they're just I'm say, that's, that's so a there's, rough there's ass two prison. pictures of him stretched out different. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> one's with his legs and one's with his face. He stretches his head. Of you know course that? he paints hummingbirds. Of course he does. <laughs> of course he does. All right, so now guy keeps a head in his freezer for two yeah. years. Hummingbirds he paints Phyllis's hum- head. How adorable! He paints hummingbirds. <laughs> he names them all Phyllis. <laughs> Every <laughs> single one. All right. Uh, so now we got to do the DefCon scale. So standard DefCon scale is a scale of five to one. Right. With five being the lowest, one being the highest. Now it's important to note that on this one, none of these guys are good guys. You know, they're all bad guys. Right. So number five is Lee Murray. You know, your crack dealing, kidnapping, armed robber. Okay. Number one is your purple gang, where you're doing multiple massacres and you're murdering people in the street and, you know, going to war regular. So, on a scale of Lee Murray to 
the Purple Gang, where do you rank Tommy Karate? I guess we could put it out to the field. I mean, for me, I'm going between a one and a two. He doesn't quite have the numbers up there, like killing people in the street, but he definitely was not afraid to kill. He made he loved making examples out of each other. And I mean, just as a person, he was psychotic. He chopped off heads and shit. Like he really seemed to not have too much emotions except for the girl Celeste. But even that, who knows? That could have been a weird tormented in his brain like that's his property sort of a weird joker harley quinn love situation so who even knows but yeah i mean he was definitely a straight up fucking killer so i want to go one but his numbers weren't see for me a killer is someone who just kills willy-nilly just wants to kill and it seemed like he kept himself in check for the most part even the people they killed he thought they were snitching and shit. Yeah. So I don't know, I'm going to go with a 2 just strictly cuz I feel like you could be around him without having to worry at least at one point. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, before <laughs> yeah, before things got true. dark before Cel- before Celeste died. Yeah. Yeah, I want to go 1 but for some reason I don't know if his numbers are up there that make me like I want to keep number 1 for like you said like the purple game like people do the massacres like those sort of people. Yeah. So I don't think I want to go. I'll give him two. Yeah, I'm, I'm in the same logic. I mean, figure I, w- I would probably even have had him at three if if he hadn't stored a head in his freezer for two years. Like yeah, that, that clearly showed an escalation and a change of what his whole entire behavior was. That it just kind of, um, I I don't know if he would have even done more. Uh, if he hadn't have been, ca- I mean, if, it stands to reason that if he wouldn't have been caught, then he would have continued to do what he was doing. So, but yeah, I, I put him at it too, just because, um, yeah, he clearly went off the rails toward the end there, and I don't think he would have slowed down. Well, it's a weird, because he, we don't do serial killers on this show, but I would say of all the people we've done, he's the closest thing to just a straight up serial killer. Like, if he was in any other neighborhood, he probably would have just been, a, like, from the child abuse to all that to then coming back and putting that abuse on others to just feeling like he was like – like that Talil guy we were joking like joking about like that guy wasn't even a dude to – like he said he snitched but he probably just wanted to chop him up to show homeboy how to chop up a lot. Like Mom. he really just seen people as like, yeah, I'll kill this guy. Like his mindset was like pretty fucking bad. Yeah. Well, I say we'll call it a unanimous two because, like you, I was leaning towards three. Yeah. But then once he started knocking off his whole crew, yeah. that got a little bit more fucked up. But I think in order to go one, you either have to have volume numbers or style points. You right, know what I mean? Yeah, it wasn't yeah. a lot of bosses. It wasn't no sniper shit. It wasn't nothing tricky. It was a yeah, lot it wasn't of just like a super killer. Right. Well, it was just straight. I mean, I don't know who am I to talk about it, but it was straight consistent, just gangland style. Yeah. You know, walk up to him. I mean, like you said, outside of when he first started off, the karate shit never even came up too much. Maybe if you'd have fucking oh, yeah. busted out some swords or some nunchucks, we could have moved it up there. But <laughs> yeah. but also, I mean, when it comes to that thing, like he kept it within the game. I think all of you just looking for a reason to kill. I think he's just sitting around. I mean, you got to think, like, story-wise, when you read the stories, like, yeah, he thought they were snitching, so then he did all that. But you got to figure one situation was they were probably, like, hanging out, and somebody was like, no, I don't think like you fucking snitch. Like... We've all hung out in the bar, like, hung out with someone, they get all drunk, and then they start like, Man, I can't be drunk around this guy. He just wants to start playing. Yeah, like, you can't be he, around He him seems like he's one of those certain dudes and saying, oh, they're snitching, was just an excuse for him to be stabbing people. Could have been paranoid, all that yeah, shit. Yeah, I mean, he definitely seemed pretty paranoid. No. So, all right, so we're going to go to DEF CON 2. Take it to DEF CON 2. You heard that, gentlemen? DEF CON 2. Either of you guys got anything before we go? Did they describe him as sociopathic? Like after after time went on and things, you know, obviously things have evolved. Uh, speaking about true crime or speaking about criminals in general, uh, did you uh, in the research that you were doing come across anything where they started to label him as a sociopath or say that he was on actually on the way to maybe being a serial killer? Okay, here's what they said: is one they did say he's a sociopath because at first they said he. They would have labeled him a psychopath mm-hmm. if he didn't seem to really love Celeste. Got it, yeah. Um, which see, I say see. is not very typical. The other thing they said that if it wasn't, he's technically, what kept him from being a serial killer is his mob affiliation. So he's a mob hitman. 
but they do say the collection of stuff is a yeah, serial killer trophies. tendency yeah, yeah. that they don't see from Mob Hitman. They don't do that. They're right. a lot more just callous. They do it because they don't care and it's part of the job. It's business. Right. Yeah. So for him, it was clearly more than business. Right. Yeah, that's the thing. Like It just seems like there, that there was a there, there was a urge for this lifestyle, and it just so happened that the neighborhood that he grew up in facilitated what he may have done if he was born anywhere else. Well, we'll see. I don't think, I mean, it's geographic because it happened. That well, is like all them fucking beatings. Like, that's a very common kind of within, like, almost all serial killers get picked on and beat and just that violence as a child. And then that shit, when you grow up, that's just how you are. Like, he was just born into violence. And I think that karate probably had that discipline in it. But then when he came back, that discipline went to the wayside. Yeah, so... It, it was all just hands. Yeah. Well, to finish the quote that they said earlier, the guy that said he was like a like a, a dog chained to a fence that got beaten every day. Yeah. They said eventually when that dog grows up, he's going to bite. Mm. And uh, that was basically Tommy Karate. He got the shit kicked out of him for so long. Yeah. He was broken. He was a broken dog. <laughs> Angry Man. little pit bull. All right. Well, that's, uh, that's Tommy Karate. Nice. This is the Bad Guy Podcast. Thanks for coming. Thanks for listening. Oh, yeah.